Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Betsy Reed, Editor-in-Chief of The Intercept. Thank you so much for joining us for this event today with Jeremy Scahill. As you know, Jeremy not only co-founded The Intercept, but has written several best-selling books, including Blackwater and Dirty Wars. We'll be talking today about the state of U.S. empire and foreign policy in the wake of Trump, looking back at the past year of President Joe Biden's administration and also ahead at the looming conflicts and crises that will define 2022. We'll also be airing a lively discussion between Jeremy and California Representative Ro Khanna about some of the defining foreign, foreign policy questions facing the country today. Before we get started, I'd like just to say a few words about The Intercept. We are part of First Look Institute. It's a nonprofit that is also home to Field Division and the Press Freedom Defense Fund. FLI's mission is to support fearless investigative journalism and, and innovative and cinematic nonfiction filmmaking, and also to provide legal support to protect the right to a free press. The Intercept's work has never felt more urgent as the lethal operations of our government remain cloaked in secrecy, while at the same time, enormously powerful private institutions face virtually no accountability for the part they have played in the erosion of our democracy. Indeed, at The Intercept, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to cover the nexus of government and the private sector, and how coziness between corporations and government is at the root of so many of the threats we face, from climate change to US imperialism and militarism. To produce the type of journalism, we have to remain fiercely independent of influence from corporate advertisers. Thankfully, we've been able to rely on donors to fund our work. A few years ago, we launched a membership program, and since then, more than 70,000 readers have stepped up to support us. We're incredibly grateful for that. If you're a member, thank you. And if you're not, I hope you'll consider joining us. You can make a donation by visiting theintercept.com slash donate. We'll have time at the end of this event to take questions from you. If you wanna ask one, please put it into the chat on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook or Twitter and we'll do our best to answer it. It's my pleasure now to invite the Intercept senior correspondent and editor at large, Jeremy Scahill to join us. Thanks, Betsy. It's hey, really great to be here with you. Great to have you. Um, Jeremy, I thought we would start by just, I, I wanted to ask you to share some of your, your current thinking. You, ju you just published um, a major piece about bipartisan uh, policies on militarism and U.S. empire. Um, and you also did a deep dive a few months ago into Joe Biden and um, it was entitled Empire Politician. So, I mean, maybe you could set the stage for the conversation that we're gonna have today and your, your conversation with Ro Khanna by, by telling us um, what your thoughts are about, about that bipartisan consensus, how you see it operating uh, between the Trump era and the Biden era. You know, Betsy, we um, are living in a time of incredible uh, by, you know, polarization on Capitol Hill. Uh, certainly around many domestic issues, around the events of, uh, of uh, January 6th at the U.S. Capitol, uh, around the influence of, of Trump and the Trumpist movement, which, which has an incredible, uh, uh, unprecedented influence over the institutional Republican Party. And, and what we're seeing uh, is, is a battle between Trump and remnants of the, the neocon, so-called traditional conservative movement on, on Capitol Hill for control of uh, one of the most powerful political forces in American history, the modern Republican Party. And, and if any times uh, in our modern history called for the Democrats to be a force of resistance, it was these times. And, you know, you can turn on MSNBC or CNN or, you know, basically any uh, news network in this country or read the papers and, and you would get a perception that the Democrats are just, uh, you know, fighting tooth and nail to defeat Trumpism. And, and while that is true uh, on, on a narrow set of issues, so specifically pertaining to uh, Trump's continued lie that there was some epic fraud in the 2020 election and the attempts to undermine uh, the right to vote in this country, these are deadly serious issues. And I think that there are many Democrats who are absolutely militantly fighting uh, to protect just basic norms of a democratic society. But when you, when you zoom out and you talk about American foreign policy, even under Donald Trump, a reprehensible, monstrous character, uh, the Democrats repeatedly throughout Trump's four years in power 
gave him expanded surveillance powers. They colluded with Republicans to try to prevent the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan. They gave Trump record shattering military budgets. Donald Trump was praised by mainstream pundits like Fareed Zakaria and Van Jones uh, when he committed gross acts of uh, aggressive militarism across the world, airstrikes in Syria, uh, authorizing a deadly ground operation in Yemen that killed civilians and also killed an American soldier. They said he had become presidential when he committed these grotesque acts of, of aggressive war uh, uh, you know, on the other side of the world. Um, what we've seen happen with Joe Biden's ascent is a, a man who's, who's been in uh, public office for a half a century. There is perhaps no living politician right now that, ha that played a greater role in creating the world that Biden himself has inherited uh, as commander in chief. And you know, Biden's career is a very interesting one. I won't unpack every aspect of it, but what I will say is on some of the core issues that many of our readers and viewers care about, militarism, civil liberties, uh, the, the uh, punishment uh, uh, operation of our so-called criminal justice system, the racism of our criminal justice system, whistleblowers, the protection of their rights, um, broad protection of civil li liberties. Joe Biden has overwhelmingly been on the wrong side of history on so many of these core issues. And, and right now, what we're seeing uh, out of the Biden White House is this radical embrace of a neo-Cold War mentality. I mean, his, his defense secretary, uh, Aust General Austin, just the other day called Russia the Soviet Union and called Ukraine the Ukraine. He is using the pre-Berlin Wall falling phrases to talk about a major world superpower. And we're, we're going to talk with Rokana about uh, both Ukraine and uh, the U.S. posture toward Russia. But what I'll, what I'll say in conclusion is while there is very, a very disturbing trend with Biden's overarching approach to foreign policy, there are a couple of, of very interesting and potentially hopeful developments. First off, Joe Biden withdrew from Afghanistan. He didn't need to do that. He could have just said this was Donald Trump's reckless plan. I'm not going to implement it. Biden hinged the whole thing on saying, well, we made an agreement, and I'm sure this was a sort of subtweet of Donald Trump uh, regarding the Iran nuclear agreement, but Biden said, we make, we make agreements and we keep agreements. Uh, and so he, he overwhelmingly implemented the plan that Donald Trump uh, and his administration concocted that was thwarted and slow rolled both by the Pentagon and by lawmakers. So Biden deserves tremendous credit. There was huge pressure from within the Pentagon the uh, gaggle of retired military brass that you know pepper the airwaves of this country, and even very prominent political figures like Hillary Clinton and Condoleezza Rice. So I give Joe Biden unqualified credit and praise for actually withdrawing from Afghanistan. In the ta at the tail end of that withdrawal, he authorized uh, a, a terribly horrifying drone strike that killed ten civilians, including seven children. Uh, and and we can talk later about drone warfare. But there has been a plummet uh, in the pace of U.S. drone strikes, and 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 I can get into some of why that is later. But just just to set up this conversation with Rokana, it's all of these things that are sort of looming over this conversation that we had. And Rokana is is one of only a handful of American Congress people who have uh, really militantly fought to cut off Saudi Arabia. Who I may not agree with every single thing that Rokhana does. He makes compromises that I think are not, you know, the, the, not the kinds of things that uh, people that really want a radical alternative to the way the American empire has operated. Um, but he overwhelmingly is, is trying to shake things up in Washington and to do it with justice, peace, and morality in mind, which is very unfortunately unusual, not just in politics, but also within the Democratic Party. So we're talking about it at a time when there is hostility toward China and Russia, threats of invasions. Um, we have a reduction in drone strikes. We have questions about what the Biden administration's counterterrorism policy is going to be. So all of that is, is hanging over this conversation that I had with Ro Khanna. Great. Let's go to the, the Ro Khanna interview now. Representative Ro Khanna, thank you very much for being with us here at The Intercept. Thank you for having me back on. 
So, you know, I, I, I want to, in a moment, get to the uh, amendment that you tried to push through with the National Defense uh, Authorization Act this year that, as I understand it, has now been stripped from the Senate version of the bill that deals with uh, weapons support for Saudi Arabia, the war in, in Yemen. But I, I actually want to begin uh, from a sort of 30,000 foot uh, perspective and, and ask you in the big picture what you make of, of what seems to be a kind of neo-Cold War posturing on the part of the Biden administration regarding Russia and China right now. What, what, what is happening? Well, we should not replicate the Cold War paradigm for either China or Russia. It doesn't mean that we don't take those threats seriously, but if you look at our defense budget, uh, it is higher than the defense budget was at the height of the Cold War. It is a larger number. Uh, far, it's more than Trump's defense budgets were. Uh, so in my view, this is a, a complete mistake. Uh, it's not what's going to allow America to succeed in the 21st century. A lot of this money goes to defense contractors uh, where the average executive makes over $5 billion a year. Uh, and some of the rhetoric uh, is, is dangerous. Doesn't mean again that we don't have threats, uh, but we ought to put those in perspective. Yeah, you know, the other day, Defense Secretary Austin actually uh, slipped up and he uh, he referred to Russia as the, the Soviet Union when he was talking about what he also called the Ukraine uh, using Cold War terminology. But on that issue of, of Ukraine, uh, I want to get your take on the call between President Vladimir Putin and, and Joe Biden that took place uh, on Tuesday. But, but first, I just want to ask you something really basic. The United States portrays Russia as this violent, menacing actor in its own sphere of influence uh, and is uh, really sort of ratcheting up the rhetoric uh, about potential aggression in Ukraine from Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, isn't isn't the, the the U.S. operating a bit on the nose here, given the fact that it is engaged in an eastward expansion uh, of NATO, that there's been this flirtation with with Ukraine becoming part of NATO? I mean, if you were, were any Russian leader, not just Vladimir Putin, wouldn't you take this as a direct threat to your territorial integrity and a major world power in the NATO alliance, essentially trying to just move completely into your front yard? I think we have to, first of all, be clear eyed about Putin. I mean, he's uh, been a bad actor in terms of uh, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, uh, the, the uh, usurpation of uh, Crimea, uh, the uh, crimes that he's committed against political opponents. So uh, I, I don't think that there's any need for an apology uh, for Putin <laughs> from my perspective. That said, I have always been of the view that we. Uh, it, it's un, it's uh, needlessly provocative uh, to have uh, Ukraine uh, become part of NATO. That has been my position. It's actually uh, Henry Kissinger's position. There are a lot of people who've said uh, that that is uh, unnecessarily provocative. And if you actually care about the United States uh, competition with China, I mean, Russia's GDP is about 1.6 trillion. Uh, and uh, you probably don't want to have uh, a two-front uh, conflict uh, where you're going to push Russia uh, closer to, to, to China. So uh, my view is that we ought to be uh, clear-eyed with Putin that uh, the invasion uh, will not stand and put the sanctions and other things uh, on the table as the president has made clear uh, and be tough. Uh, but I think when it comes to uh, Ukraine not being part of NATO, uh, that seems to me a, a reasonable position for the United States to take. Uh, on this issue of lethal aid to Ukraine, as you well know, uh, when Barack Obama was president and Joe Biden was vice president, the Obama administration was very hesitant to cross that line of providing lethal aid. And of course, Donald Trump famously, infamously made a big deal about that and said, we're opening the spigot. Um, then there was the side, the sidebar of the impeachment that also uh, had Ukraine at its center and Joe Biden's son and, and, uh, and, and what have you. But on a, on, a, on a very serious level, where do you fall on this? Is it appropriate for the United States to be delivering lethal aid, which the Biden administration says it's going to continue to do to Ukraine? Is, isn't that a provocation that only plays into 
perhaps Vladimir Putin's hand as you've described it? I want to be clear that the blame is on Putin for threatening to invade a sovereign country of Ukraine. And we should be very clear that that you, is- uh, You are very clear about that. I'm, 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 like, I'm, I'm, I'm support, trying to I hold support, our government accountable. But I don't support, uh, I don't support our government uh, providing uh, lethal arms that could be used uh, certainly in an offensive weapon in Ukraine. I think that's only escalating uh, the conflict uh, and I don't support us uh, pushing to uh, include Ukraine in, in NATO. I think uh, we ought to try to de-escalate by not pushing further the, uh, the expansion of NATO uh, and by not providing uh, these lethal, uh, lethal arms to, to Ukraine. I don't think that that's uh, necessary uh, to, to prevent the uh, prevent an invasion or uh, and and risks uh, a a a a war that can get get out of hand uh, for the world. You know, speaking of of lethal weapons, I want to ask you now about your legislation or your attempted uh, uh, amendment uh, on the NDAA. Certainly, it passed the House uh, and it's been stripped from the Senate. Um, but walk people through. Uh, what your position is right now on Joe Biden's position on Saudi Arabia and, and Yemen. Because Biden, to remind people, uh, said, at first he said he was going to treat them as the pariahs that they are. Um, and that really hasn't happened. Instead, Biden said, well, we're not going to give them offensive weapons. But many human rights groups and, and NGOs uh, have, have made clear that actually the weapons that Biden is designating as defensive are ultimately all offensive weapons because of the Saudi strategy, particularly in, in Yemen. But, but give an overview of what you are trying to do on a legislative level to end the genocidal war in Yemen and confront Saudi Arabia. Well, this is a war that's gone on for over five years. It's a war that we uh, gave the Saudis the green light to undertake, that we aided the Saudis uh, in conducting, uh, that has led to uh, a massive starvation in Yemen uh, thousands of people killed, women and children, one of the great humanitarian catastrophes uh, in the world. And we don't have any control over the Houthis. We do have control over the Saudis. And what uh, Senator Sanders and I did, passing the first war powers resolution through the House and the Senate, is we said the United States should cease uh, all uh, support and aid for the Saudis in conducting uh, the war in Yemen. And that passed the House, that passed the Senate. It was vetoed by President Trump. In doing that, Trump voluntarily suspended the refueling. Uh, he didn't announce it. Biden formalized that policy and took a, a step forward in saying, OK, it's the United States policy now that we're not going to refuel uh, any uh, airstrikes, uh, uh, airplanes engaged in airstrikes in Yemen. That was a positive step. Sanders and I applauded it. But uh, it has not led uh, to the cessation of the Saudi bombing campaign in Yemen. It has not led to the lifting of the blockade. Uh, so right now, the, they, they, the administration has not done nearly enough. Uh, what Sanders and I have said is you supported uh, the very people in the administration at high positions, when they weren't in the administration, supported Sanders and not my amendment, which says stop you could ground the Saudi Air Force, basically, from going into Yemen. Stop supplying them with the tires. Stop supplying them with the parts. We could literally stop them from undertaking uh, this campaign. And uh, so far, the administration has not been willing to do that. They could do that voluntarily, uh, stopping uh, doing that, or they could uh, support more forcefully uh, our amendment. Now, they say, well, look, the Houthis are launching uh, missiles into the Saudi uh, territory. That is true. And I'm not saying that the Houthis are blameless, uh, but uh, the Houthis by and large have won a large part uh, of the war, at least, uh, you know, in the Northern Territory. And the Saudis need to realize that the, the war is lost. The only way we're going to get to a negotiated peace uh, is if the Saudis realize that. And our complicity, our ability to influence is with the Saudis. So instead of just saying the Houthis, 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 which we all know we have no control over, we ought to get the Saudis to stop, get them to the peace table, and that's the best way of ending this, this war. I also want to ask you about a related issue, and that is uh, Iran. You know, often the, the you have, over the years, the, uh, the, there are political figures in the United States that have alleged that the Houthi movement and the Houthi government is essentially just a proxy for Iran. Now, I've spent a lot of time uh, on the ground in Yemen and have covered the, the situation with the Houthis prior to them 
taking power. And my read on it, uh, Representative Khanna, just to share it for one second, is that the, the US and Saudi policy ultimately pushed the Houthis into a closer alliance with Iran through their hostility. Yes, the Houthis had their death to America slogan and they had all sorts of relations with Iran, but militarily, uh, the US position and the Saudi position seems to have created a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy where now Iran does feel uh, like it's uh, it has a great stake in the future outcome of what the Saudis uh, with support from the United States are doing in Yemen. Trevor, your reporting seems uh, plausible, Ron. Uh, I guess I would say there's no doubt in my mind that Houthis have committed uh, crimes as well, that the Houthis are not innocent actors, that what they're doing in Marib is uh, problematic. Uh, I, I don't doubt that they're uh, launching missiles into the Saudi territory, uh, and that that's, that's wrong. I guess my view is, if you want to stop the war, what leverage does the United States have? And the first thing is, we ought to stop the party that we were aiding that uh, accelerated the war, and that was the Saudis. We have leverage to get the Saudis to stop. I believe if you stop the Saudi in interference in the war, you will, you've already helped stop the UAE interference by and large, uh, and that will lead to the de-escalation, de-entanglement also of Iran. And then you make it much more a uh, conflict within Yemen that can uh, have some chance of a brokered, a brokered peace. But I don't see what leverage the United States has uh, but, but that with Saudi Arabia. If we didn't start this, you could say, well, why should we get involved? But we have a moral obligation given it, it was we were complicit in the escalation of the Saudi war uh, in Yemen. I also want to ask you about uh, uh, the potential for a renewal uh, or, or a re-engagement of the uh, JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement that Donald Trump uh, walked out on. Uh, I think a lot of Iranians had hoped that uh, Joe Biden was going to prioritize this and try to move quickly. And my understanding from Iranian sources is that their perception of the Biden administration right now uh, is that um, Biden is ultimately bolstering the position of the hardliners in Iran by sending a message that it doesn't matter if it's Trump or Biden, you are not, we are not going to uh, uh, come into any kind of an agreement like this again without throwing a whole new round of concessions at you. Do you think that Biden has made a mistake in not moving more quickly or showing more interest in returning to the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal? I do believe it was a missed opportunity. I mean, I was a very big supporter of Rob Malley. I thought he made the perfect choice in the envoy there. Malley really understood the region. Uh, he and frankly, Jake Sullivan helped engineer in part the original Iran deal. I thought it was one of the most imaginative things that President Obama did. Obama was, of course, steeped in the history with the CIO's role with Mossadegh. He wanted to have a fundamental reset uh, of the region. He understood it. Uh, and he really was close to transforming not just our relationship with Iran, but I believe he, he thought it would transform our relationship uh, with the Middle East. Trump tried the other approach, and the irony is Iran is today far closer to getting a nuclear weapon. The maximum pressure campaign simply didn't work, just on realist grounds. So my view was the, the President uh, Biden should have come in uh, and been willing to take uh, more of a risk for uh, getting back in the agreement. You could have had snapback sanctions, uh, but it shouldn't have been, you have to do all of this before we move. Uh, that was the approach Rob Malley was uh, advocating. Uh, I think there was a lot of pressure uh, on uh, people to, to not listen to Malley. Uh, he was kept on the sidelines too long. Uh, I, I wish we were more aggressive in trying to get back into that deal. I want to ask you about drone strikes, and, and I know you're aware of these facts, but just to share with, with other people that are, are listening to us, uh, the Biden administration on day one, uh, the day of Joe Biden's inauguration, uh, issued an order through the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, that effectively re uh, reversed all of Donald Trump's removal of the guidelines, particularly about civilian deaths and rules for drone strikes that were implemented in the second term of Barack Obama and, and Joe Biden. So the first thing that Joe Biden did on, on the issue of drone strikes and civilians was to say, we're gonna get rid of all of these moves that Trump made to delegate authority further down the chain of command to authorize strikes. 
uh, to lift restrictions on strikes when you believe that there's a, a possibility of civilians uh, being killed. Uh, and there is a review that the Biden administration has supposedly been undertaking now for, for uh, the entire duration of this first year of the term. My understanding is it was supposed to come out uh, around the time of the Afghanistan withdrawal, uh, but was delayed uh, because of the August 29th drone strike in Kabul that killed 10 civilians, including seven children. Uh, so there, there are two parts to this, Representative Khanna. I wanna start first with the drone strike in Afghanistan on August 29th, the Pentagon uh, did its own internal review and determined that essentially no one should be held accountable for this. We know from the reporting of the New York Times and other news organizations uh, that there, was, uh, there were civilians, including a child, clearly visible on the United States' own drone surveillance video. Is it acceptable? that you can have a nation as powerful as the United States authorize a drone strike where 10 out of 10 people killed are civilians and say no one has to be held accountable for this and essentially, oops, fog of war, we'll throw some money at, at victims' families, but we have to move on. It's a very uh, tough moral question. I What I have called for uh, explicitly is the compensation of the families and the resettlement of the families uh, to the United States. I mean, I would have to look at uh, why the uh, administration, the Pentagon, what their review was. Uh, if it was an erroneous judgment made on a reasonable basis, uh, I think it's hard to go after people uh, in a way that uh, uh, has liability. If there was some gross negligence or something that was uh, not following the protocol, uh, then I think you you obviously have to hold people accountable, uh, but I, I would have to look at what their review was. Uh, and uh, my bigger uh, view is that there ought to be the proper guardrails and there ought to be the proper uh, just compensation and just actions uh, when things like this happen. And, and, and on this issue, I'm sure you're familiar with, with the process that's underway. It's a, a comprehensive counterterrorism review, but part of it is going to deal with the question of uh, civilian, uh, the potential for civilian deaths and drone strikes and how the Pentagon in particular, and hopefully we'll also see something about the CIA, what the rules Biden is going to implement look like. Some sources have said that they expect it to be uh, building on the Obama era guidance, which human rights groups said was not adequate enough, but it certainly was more than existed under Donald Trump. But other sources say that there may, there may be a hybrid where some of Trump's uh, ideas are incorporated into it, and that would be bad news. What what do you what rules do you think should govern United States so-called targeted killing operations with regard to the potential of civilian deaths or injuries? Very strict rules. Well, first there ought to be clear clarity of disclosure. Senator Warren and I have called for an accurate reporting of how many civilian casualties there that actually result because of these operations. I don't think we have a clear number, and at the very least, we ought to be first uh, transparent about what's going on, even when uh, all of the media isn't watching as they were in Afghanistan. Second, there ought to be uh, a clear uh, a sense of uh, multiple sign-offs before uh, you can undertake uh, such a, uh, a strike. And it ought to have uh, a clear level of, of, of review, uh, a clear sense that people in Afghanistan uh, just saying someone was driving a Toyota Corolla when Toyota Corollas are the cars that vast majority of Afghanis uh, uh, drive, I don't think that's a sufficient basis to, uh, to strike. So there ought to be uh, both multiple reviews uh, and uh, as well as clear criteria of what uh, is a, a legitimate reason uh, to, to, uh, to say that you can strike. Now, obviously, that has to be balanced with the speed of doing something. If you have a terrorist uh, a threat. Uh, so I the details here matter, but I guess I would err on the side of strengthening the Obama uh, regulations rather than weakening them. Rokana, I wanna thank you so much for uh, for being with us and um, and also thanks for the hard work that you you do on Capitol Hill, particularly on this issue of civilian deaths and, uh, and you've been relentless in trying to cut off Saudi Arabia's uh, weapons stream from the United States, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your journalism. And uh, obviously, you ask uh, questions that get to the very heart of the, the, the moral issues. And 
uh, these are things as the world's greatest power uh, with our ideals that we have to continue to strive to, to live up to. Well, I, I know, you know, you, you engage with uh, so many different kinds of people. You're an unusual, I, I'm not sure if people have actually understand that, but you're an unusual character uh, for a congressman because you're, you're really willing to mix it up on a lot of podcasts and, and shows that most lawmakers would never appear on. And I, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's really cool what you do. And I know that our, uh, our readers and viewers really, uh, really appreciate it anytime they see you. I appreciate always being on. Thanks, Ro. Thank you. You know, Betsy, what I, uh, what really I want to say coming out of that of that interview with uh, what I want to say coming out of that interview with uh, Ro Khanna, um, we recorded that on on Tuesday night, and you know, there's a, a bit of breaking news from last night, which is that the Senate voted uh, to uh, voted down an amendment or resolutions rather from, uh, and they were bipartisan from Republicans Rand Paul and Mike Lee, and from Independent aligned with Democrats Bernie Sanders. Uh, that would have blocked the export of $650 million worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia. I mean, this includes 600 Raytheon-made missile launchers, 300 air-to-air -air missiles, uh, spare parts, maintenance support. Uh, and this, was, this is a priority of the Biden administration. And I just want to emphasize this, that the, the Democrats are colluding with the Republicans yet again to try to uh, just stomp down and out this opposition to arming a government that is committing genocide through its warfare and starvation policies in, in Yemen. And it's being requested by the Biden administration to keep the spigot open for weapons of a country ruled by unelected despots who murdered a Washington Post journalist. It's like, does anyone remember the temporary outrage over that? Does anyone remember Joe Biden going on at great length, how he was uniquely positioned to make the Saudis the pariahs that they are on the international stage. So un understand that, uh, you know, politics is so fickle. And when Jamal Khashoggi was, was murdered, you had this rare moment when the fight that Rohana and Bernie Sanders and others have been waging for a while gained enough momentum that even someone like Lindsey Graham was willing to go along with it, the re Republican senator and Donald Trump golf buddy. Um, you know, and Trump, of course, vetoed it. But my, my point is, you had Democrats earlier this year in the House voting to, to, to put $25 billion more in the defense budget than Joe Biden even asked for. You have Joe Biden saying, I'm going to turn the Saudis into pariahs and then turning around, and, and I'm not going to give them offensive weapons, and then turning around and giving a fat contract for Raytheon sales to Saudis with US money that the Democrats help create. So that's the context for what Ro Khanna is is talking about and and it's just it's it's really disgusting how strong that uh bond is between the power elite and the corporation the defense corporations in the US and the bipartisan war party on Capitol Hill and this unelected Saudi royals who are despotic butchers waging a genocidal war i mean it's it's remarkable that that this yet again is happening given the rhetoric from the current commander in chief on the campaign trail of what he said he would do. Undoubtedly, yes. Um, I wanted to switch gears um, and take some questions from the audience. We got a lot of them and they hit um, many of the themes that, that you have begun to explore and, and many of the topics that we've covered at The Intercept, in particular around the, the size of the military budget, the military industrial complex, the relationships between these defense corporations and the Biden administration. So um, we have a lot to dig into here and um, a few minutes left. So let me start with um, a question from Janine from Philadelphia. She asks, like many immigrants, I know firsthand that the average person abroad knows more about US foreign policy than the average US cable news host. Can we ever get people to hold the government accountable on foreign policy if mainstream media refuses to cover it with any seriousness? Jeremy, what, what do you think? Question, how, how would you- Thank you very, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question, uh, Janine. And sorry, we have like a half second uh, delay here. So I apologize for, for the, the crosstalk. Um, you know, I, I think, first of all, we just have to recognize something before I address the media component of this. Um, the defense industry in the United States has purchased 
uh, many Democratic and Republican politicians through campaign contributions and lobbying and sweetheart deals and enrichment for their districts. Um, and our political process is thoroughly and entirely contaminated by corporate influence. It, it, it is exactly what Dwight Eisenhower warned of in his farewell address many decades ago of the rise of this military industrial complex and also media is a major component of it. But I, I, I think that to cut to the heart of it, uh, the business of America is war and that business uh, enriches politicians who do its bidding. And that industry uh, will go whichever way the wind is blowing. If, it's, if the Democrats seem like they're more likely to take power, that you're gonna see an uptick in contributions to their campaigns. If they see, think the Republicans, you're gonna see an uptick in their campaigns. On the issue of the media, I mean, I, I think that, that it is important, very important to cover the events of January 6th. I think it's very important to cover the Trumpist movement and the threats that it poses to democratic processes in this country, um, but it is unconscionable the dearth of coverage of wars that the United States is waging across the world that you can watch. Uh, and I, I, I'm basically completely off cable news now. I don't, I mean, I certainly don't appear on it. I'm not allowed really. Um, but also I just, I just don't watch it because it contaminates your brain. It's like poison with the exception of a few hosts. And, and you, you could watch MSNBC in particular with the exception of people like Betty Hassan and, and Ayman Mulhuddin, like they, they deserve credit. They have people that are really smart on foreign policy. But in general, when you watch primetime MSNBC, what you are getting um, is, is just the Trump show again. And, and I think that there is a way in which this only helps Trump. You know, yes, this should be covered, but it only helps Trump. And my God, we are an imperial nation, the most powerful, well-armed nation in the history of civilization. And we are waging both covert and overt unde undeclared wars uh, around the world. And you almost never see real coverage of it. Um, it's not to say that these networks don't ever cover foreign policy, they do. But this is like, a it, we've been in a code red situation for a half a century in the United States with our war policy. And, and it, 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 it's, it's just sad and pathetic and an indication of the bankrupt nature of so much of our media culture on these issues that you, you, there is not just a dedication to basic information about these wars being given to people on a drumbeat basis. Yeah, and not only that, but you see on on cable news the 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 very presence of the military industrial complex in the form of these so-called retired generals who often have multiple appointments on on boards of Raytheon and you know and 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 that's hardly ever disclosed when they're commenting on you know, whatever uh, particular threat is being um, hyped at the moment. Well, just to, to say something about that, Betsy, I mean, I, I, I referenced how I'm not on cable news anymore. And um, I, I, I just want to tell you, the last time I was invited uh, onto CNN, I had been on CNN many, many times consistently, MSNBC as well. Uh, I haven't been on any uh, MSNBC or CNN with the exception of one thing I did with Mehdi Hassan a, a, a while ago for his Peacock show. But the last time I was allowed on CNN, uh, I uh, directly criticized by name retired generals who are on CNN's payroll and are not disclosing their uh, relationship to the pro for profit in the war industry. Um, and I also named Fareed Zakaria uh, for his posturing on war. And this was on Brian Stelter's show, and I have never been allowed on CNN since. You are not allowed to criticize uh, Fareed Zakaria and the gaggle of uh, retired generals that CNN has on its airwaves and to state facts about the conflicts of interest in not disclosing who they profit from. Um. I'm going to go next to a question um, from Abdurafi from Parkville, Maryland. Um, he asks, until the military industrial complex lobbying war machine is diminished, wars will be justified with one way or another for more sales of their weapons while the regular people pay the price here via taxpayers paying for the wars or there via loss of lives, properties, hope, including the credibility of developed countries' democratic institutions. What does it take to decouple or at least weaken the lobbying war machines from the normal process of adopting policy, policies that benefit the American people first and creating less enemies abroad? Um, I think that's an excellent question. And, you know, I, I've been really interested to see that a lot of these questions, people are kind of searching for ways because we've seen these patterns in place for so many decades 
like what is going to make a difference um, is a common kind of question people naturally have. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that, Jeremy. Well, you know, you know, I, I, I have a bit of, I guess, a depressing answer to that, which is that I, I, I think that the entire structure of our system is rigged. It's rigged in favor of the money elite. It's rigged in favor of uh, major corporations who are uh, who have uh, much greater influence over politicians than ordinary people do. No matter how many ordinary people uh, bind together, the the war industry, the pharmaceutical industry, um, the 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 chemical industry. I mean, these the, these are, are are serious power brokers. So I, I guess that my realist answer is is that you would need a, a fundamental oval overhaul of our campaign finance system. Uh, you would also need to have politicians from both parties. Um, I, I mean, ideally, we would have multi-party system in this country, but from both parties um, willing to stand up uh, to the war industry and to de-link profits from the uh, expansion of warfare. But this is all pie in the sky, uh, you know, stuff that we can, you know, you, you talk about in fairy tale land. Um, but on a on a more realistic level, I think that what we we saw in uh, in both the Rand Paul political campaigns earlier in the 2000s when he was running an insurgent campaign for the Republican uh, uh, nomination. And uh, and then more recently with the campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders, is, is that I, I think that our hope on, on these and other issues lies in shattering the two-party system. Uh, and, you know, Rand Paul, uh, sorry, Ron Paul, Rand Paul's father, uh, was a militant anti-war guy. I don't agree with much of, of, of Rand Paul's ideas about domestic things and, and their racial questions. And I mean, I, we should be clear about all that. But on war policies and on civil liberties policies, Rand Paul was shaking up the system and he was a threat to that system. And the same is true uh, of the Bernie Sanders campaign. And, you know, the institutional uh, elite of the Democratic Party were in a severe state of panic when Bernie Sanders uh, appeared on course to get the nomination, and you know they 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 trot out you know this in, these endorsements for Joe Biden, and they coalesce, and people drop out, and Barack Obama intervenes, and and they basically just sort of were like in a panic attack and said, well, Joe Biden doesn't seem to be entirely with it. Which I mean, I'm I'm, I'm sorry, like that during that campaign, it was bananas to watch Joe Biden speak. You know, something happened there where all of a sudden he started talking in a more cogent way. But like it was bananas at times to watch Joe Biden speak. It was like really disturbing. And but this guy was sort of like the only hope, <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi, for the the sort of elite political class in Washington, for the military industrial complex. And, you know, Joe Biden, to the extent that he is really solely calling shots, um, his administration is is basically a caretaker government for the imperial uh, corporate interests of the United States. Not to say that Biden hasn't done some good things. I, of course, Joe Biden has done some good things in office. Um, but you know, the, the fact is that the only way I think we actually, you know, to answer totally honestly, the only way we could actually uh, change any of the things from that question um, is by radically changing our political system, our campaign finance system, and by moving toward a multi-party system in this country. I, I would just add, I mean, and this isn't revolutionary, but um, the way we try at The Intercept to, to intervene on these questions um, is just by, you know, exposing the the, the coziness that, that I, between corporate America and multinational companies and government across the board, not only in the defense industry fueling the policies on war and surveillance, but, you know, in environmental area, in, in at the EPA, at, at the FDA, you know, across the board, um, in terms of climate change, you know, we have, we have way too much closeness between powerful companies that have a vested interest in, in blocking reform that would save the planet and protect people and, and, um, and wars. And um, and the government that is elected to to try to represent the people. So th that is a the the one area that you know gives me a little bit of hope is that I do feel that when we are successful in exposing those things, it does generate outrage, and that outrage is across the board. It's not just among 
you know, tried and true uh, Democrats and progressives. It cuts both ways. And you saw that um, actually in Virginia, um, Terry McAuliffe was a vulnerable candidate because of his closeness to corporations and lobbyists. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's something that the Republicans will use uh, very, you know, cynically and opportunistically because they are, you know, even more um, deeply in bed with, with, you know, the corporate establishment. But, um, but it is something that I, I do think has some resonance with people. Um, and I think that by, you know, by what we can do as journalists is just make sure people understand what is actually happening and what these connections are and how, you know, uh, big defense companies are, you know, one of our reporters has frequently um, listened to sort of earnings calls and, and, and really got um, caught uh, these, these companies talking about how the escalation of hostilities is actually good for business. So when you can highlight those moments, I think there's, there's an opportunity to at least, you know, educate people, move them and, and get them to think differently and put, put pressure on politicians to, to, you know, get rid of that kind of influence. Well, I, I, I think you're right. And I, I mean, I would, I would point people uh, in particular to the work that, um, that Sharon Lerner has done um, for the intercept um, on, on poisonous chemicals and environmental uh, degradation. Um, and, and, and I mean, she's one of the greatest, uh, you know, investigative reporters working right now. And, you know, the, it's, it's sometimes the headlines, uh, you know, are, 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 are for pieces spread around. Um, but a lot of times it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get people to pay attention to these issues, but the intercept is covering uh, a whole range of issues and breaking stories that no one else is, uh, is reporting on. And, and I think that our, our politics team in particular in, in Washington, DC, um, is, is just constantly breaking story after story after story is ahead of the curve on so many trends that you then uh, eventually see. Um, the Intercept also did a phenomenal uh, series of reporting on death squads in Afghanistan that was, uh, you know, spearheaded by by journalist Andrew Quilty, and it's it's and edited by Vanessa Gazzari. Um, You know, it it is a uh, it is shocking uh, the the fact that you have this sort of Phoenix program type operation uh, that goes back to the Vietnam War era that continues to be replicated in Iraq. In the earlier 2000s, in Afghanistan, leading up to the uh, the withdrawal, and you know, I mean, I I, I think the the Intercept does some of the the best long form journalism uh, around right now, and and has an incredible team of investigative reporters cutting across uh, a variety of subject matters. Um, we've got a couple more, well, actually several more questions. I'm going to try to squeeze in here. Um, Harriet from Toronto asks, is it true that Biden has stopped the use of drones that grew under Trump and I think Obama? What difference does or would that make? Jeremy, you touched yeah. on this a bit before, um, but I know that you've looked you know, pretty closely at, at these issues. And mm -hmm. what are you looking for to see from, from Biden on this front? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually working on a, a reported piece about this um, right now. And you know, what I can say is that for the first six months of Biden's pre presidency, he put a put a temporary moratorium on drone strikes. And uh, and this was, you know, as part of the process of doing this counterterrorism review. And what Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, uh, the instructions he issued was that any strikes are going to happen in, you know, non-declared war zones, places like Yemen or Somalia, uh, could no longer be authorized down the chain of command. It had to be directly approved by uh, by the White House. And and then you had a, a series of strikes or a couple of strikes that Biden authorized in Somalia six months into his administration. Uh, there have been several strikes in Syria and uh, in Iraq. Uh, you've had multiple drone strikes in Afghanistan, including this horrifying uh, strike that killed uh, an entire family and you know seven children. Um, and one thing I want to say about that is that the whistleblower, Daniel Hale, who was convicted under the Espionage Act of leaking documents to the to the media, and they were clearly talking about the Intercept. One of the facts from and Daniel Hale, by the way, is 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 doing about a four year prison sentence right now. It had been placed in a communication management unit in federal prison in Illinois, which is basically a a almost no rights 
holding situation that is usually terrorists are put in there. So the, the, the man who was convicted of, of bringing this statistic to public light is serving a four-year prison term right now in an American version of a, of a gulag. Um, and that is that uh, nine, as many as nine out of 10 people killed in kinetic operations in, in these kinds of drone strikes or raids, as many as nine out of 10 are not the intended target, uh, meaning they could be innocent civilians or they could be terrorists and we just don't know their identity, but that, that's how the US labels them. That's an incredibly important uh, uh, fact to bring to public light. And in this case, Biden had 100% civilian kill rate in, in this uh, drone strike. Now, having said all of that, absolutely across the board, drone strikes have plummeted and uh, it is yet to be seen what the ultimate strategy is going to be from the Biden administration. Um, I, I think the Afghanistan drone strike gave them pause, um, even though there's a self-exoneration machine at play. I think there's a, a tremendous focus right now on major nation state adversaries like Russia uh, and China. That is sort of a, you know, a distraction from the wars in the Middle East. But the final thing I'll say about this is that Biden already is on pace uh, to uh, conduct more U.S. airstrikes in Somalia uh, in this year of his presidency than Barack Obama did on average during his drone war presidency. So it's not exactly that the whole equation has changed, but without question, the frequency of drone strikes across a number of uh, targeted countries has just plummeted under Joe Biden. And I hope that that holds. Um, but, you know, I, I, as I'm hearing, we may get some kind of a hybrid from Biden, and I wouldn't be surprised if we saw those numbers spike again, particularly if there's a major terrorist attack somewhere in the US claims to be trying to hunt down the perpetrators. But um, for now, I think Biden deserves credit for sort of saying we need to like pump the brakes while recognizing that they've also murdered civilians uh, less than a year into his uh, presidency in a very grotesque attack. A story that we did um, a couple years ago um, was about the how drone drone technology, thanks in large part to to the U.S. investment in it, has become, um, if not universal, very widespread around the world, um, including in Turkey. Um, I'm not sure if people can hear me. All right, I'm yeah, going to move I mean, to I, a I, question. I can pick this up, Betsy. Um, if you, if you want, I'm just to, just to say something quickly about that. I mean, be, as a result of uh, of the U.S. just radical embrace of the the drone as the primary tool of assassination around the world, and and particularly because of Barack Obama, Mr. Constitutional Law Scholar, using his uh, credibility and support uh, among liberals, transform the way that many. Uh, people perceived drone strikes. But what it also did is it said to other nations around the world, some of them major nation states, some of them terrorist groups, uh, hey, we can do this. You know, we can make our own kind of drones. So you, you have dozens upon dozens of countries now in the world that have weaponized drones. And, and this is a very, very ominous development. And I think, I, I think the next phase of all of this is you're gonna see another country start to say, we're going to just start using this as our primary tool to whack people that we don't want to be living anymore. Yeah, and I mean, you, people can look for we're we're doing um, a, a story that should be out in the next few days that will be looking at um, developments of, of drone technology and potential use along the U.S. border. Um, so we have that to look forward to. Um, I think we just have a couple minutes left um, and a couple questions. So um, here's one from Colette from Mount Pleasant, Utah. Does the work that the Friends and other anti-war groups lobby, lobbying do in D.C. have any effect? Who are the effective groups lobbying for reasonable military spending? We actually have a lot of questions in this vein to sort of about what can be done. I mean, because we have this bloated budget. It doesn't seem like there's, you know, all the organizing that good people have put in have ha hasn't paid off yet. So I don't know, Jeremy, you you probably have knowledge of some specific groups that you think have, have done particularly admirable work. Well, I mean, first, I just want to say that I, you know, I, I, I believe that there are, um, you know, there are many, many reasons to to try to agitate for change and to try to stop the sort of belligerent posture of the United States. 
And, and I, I do think that an inside outside strategy, given our current political system, um, makes a lot of sense. And you have groups like the American Friends Service Committee, uh, which, was, which was mentioned there, that for many decades have done uh, that kind of lobbying. You have peace action um, you know, as, as well that really, I think, have a great moral compass. And they desperately try to appeal to lawmakers to take these big, big issues very, very seriously. Um, but you also have activists um, who, and you know, I'll, I'll mention. I think uh, you know, Code Pink has just stayed the course uh, with with being clear eyed about trying to stop this. They've been all over the drone issue for a long time. They've been all over Saudi Arabia uh, and 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 trying to cut off the U.S. They've disrupted congressional hearings, etc. I, I mean, I, I think lobbying is important, but you know, you're you're outgunned there trying to to, to take on the defense industry. Um, so I do think an inside outside strategy, um, you know, is is required. But also, I would I would kick it all back to the campaign finance system and you know finding uh, you know ordinary people supported movements uh, for political candidates means that you can have them not beholden to corporations. So I would I would really put an emphasis on that. So I have of one last question, Jeremy, before we break, um, and that is, um, you know, in the entire post 9-11 period, we have been we've seen the 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 growth of executive power um, and that has been handed from administration to administration, even as you know, we've seen looming threats like Trump. We've have incredibly warlike um Republican administrations, and it, it does seem that the Democrats have been critical in many ways of the excesses of these Republicans on, on matters of, of foreign policy and war, but then they have not done anything to actually, you know, prevent abuses um, in, you know, if, if Republicans take power. So it does seem to me that given the fact that we had four years of Trump, we somehow survived it, um, there is a real memory of, of just how dangerous that was. Is, is there an awareness um, in the Biden administration that, that, that there's a real risk of that happening again? And has he taken any steps or do you, are there any that you think could be on the horizon that would be me meaningful changes and checks on the executive power that, that you know, we, we've seen grow in this um, really alarming manner? Um, in the last 20 years? This is a very difficult question to answer in like 60 seconds or less. Um, but but my short version of it is I think it, the greatest opportunity we had was when Barack Obama uh, took power uh, to confront uh, basically the unitary executive theory that was the love, you know, the, the love fest of, uh, of Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld's of the world, which basically says that the executive branch when it comes to matters of national security and foreign policy is, is effectively a dictatorship and that Congress's only function um, is to finance it. Uh, Joe Biden spent the early part of his career fighting for a robust War Powers Act, uh, which is being violated by every president since. Um, I, you know, I think Joe Biden um, would be in a very unique position uh, to take the War Powers Act and, and enforce it and, um, and, and, and enhance it. Um, but the failure of Barack Obama to rein in executive power and then to create his own secret parallel judicial system for assassinating people around the world, I mean, it was just a catastrophe. So uh, this is a bipartisan issue. Joe Biden has a little bit of an interesting history on it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to be top on his priorities. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the War Powers Act and then uh, always trying to make congressional oversight powers far more robust and, and not uh, uh, permit the kind of cozy relationship between certain chairs of the intelligence committees through history um, and the CIA itself. So all of this needs to be reined in and put in check. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you to the audience for listening and for asking so many great questions. I wish we could keep talking for hours, um, but I'm gonna let people go back to their day. Um, but one more thing before we go, um, a few a few parting words. Um, this event, which has been put on by First Look Institute, has been recorded and it will be available on our, our site at theintercept.com and also on our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with friends, acquaintances, anyone you think might be interested. Um, and if you like what you heard and would like to support the work of First Look Institute's The Intercept, please donate at 
theintercept.com slash donate. Thanks again for joining us and I hope you have a great day.